This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. John Henry Brown is a criminal defense attorney in Seattle who is best known for his work on behalf of the notorious. One of his clients was Ted Bundy, a serial killer who back in the 1970s murdered scores of women in at least a half a dozen states. Mr. Brown also represented Benjamin Ng, who in 1983 participated in a robbery that left 13 dead. And just last year, he represented Robert Bales, a former sergeant in the U.S. Army, who is now serving a life prison sentence for the murder of 16 Afghani civilians. These were, to say the least, extremely difficult cases for a defense attorney to take on. But no matter how vilified his clients, Mr. Brown could always be counted on to give prosecutors a rough time. As one prosecutor once marveled, Brown in the courtroom is like a pit bull on crack. John Henry Brown, welcome to Legally Speaking. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So when, in the defense of the notorious, you're likened to a pit bull on crack, um, you, you take that as high praise, don't you? Well, from that particular prosecutor, yes. Uh -huh. um, because it was actually, a, I had represented a professional football player um, from the Seahawks. And it was charged with some sex offenses, and there were two separate cases and in separate trials, and I won them both. Uh, they were not that difficult a case for a defense lawyer, actually. Um, they should never have been charged. But it became a high-profile thing, and she was really invested in it. So um, when she made that comment and it was put in the press, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a compliment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, uh, a couple years ago, uh, you gave an interview to the Seattle Times, and you said, quote, I am not as much of an asshole as I used to be. I definite, I've definitely mellowed. I don't assume all prosecutors are evil, which I did for a while. So with the benefit of hindsight, no pun intended, um, what sorts of things do you used to do that you're now perhaps not so proud of? Oh, you know, egging people on for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, um, using humor that may or may not be appropriate, directed at prosecutors, um, doing whatever I could to unnerve them. Um, and I have found that I do that a lot less. Um, but they're still unnerved, so that's fine with me. So. Uh -huh. There are those who would say that your theatrics, and that's the oh, word that's yeah. often used, that your theatrics in the courtroom uh, are at least partially motivated by a desire to distract from the incriminating evidence that would otherwise doom your clients. Is there any truth to that? Well, I think that's somebody who's thinking way too much. Um, no, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I love that when people say theatrics or the other word I've heard a lot is um, flamboyant. And, and yes. I, I, um, I figured out 15 or 20 years ago that flamboyant actually means a lawyer that actually has a personality. Um, Most don't. It's you supposed to be funny. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I don't know. I. I I don't, nothing I do, I really can honestly say this, that nothing I do in court is an act, ever. It's all sincere. Yeah, uh -huh. and it's, no, I have some confidence um, from doing some theatrical things in the past, probably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't, 
my, my plans and t tactics for a trial are definitely planned and probably planned more than they need to be. Mm -hmm. But my behavior is, I don't think, you know, like, oh, no, I should get up and do this or do that. It's, no, I don't, I don't do that. It comes natural. Well, you've had run-ins with prosecutors, certainly. You've also had run-ins with judges. Oh, yeah. uh, for example, there was a, a superior court judge named uh, Theodore Spearman. And uh, in open court, you accused uh, Judge Spearman of having cognitive defects, and you actually requested that he postpone the case that you were trying before him so that he could get a mental evaluation. I, I don't suppose he took that suggestion kindly. No, and uh, as part of the problem, it was really probably the most uncomfortable time I've ever had in court in 35 years was doing that. Um, in, it was in a smaller county where some of the other judges in the county, after it became a big deal, and it was in the newspaper that I had told the judge that he basically had dementia, um, the judges came up to me in the hallway and said, well, we kind of agree with you. And I said, well, why is this my problem? This is not my problem. This is your problem. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you work with him. And um, the sad thing is uh, he died yeah. t two months after that, and a doctor wrote a... Um, letter to the editor in the paper saying that if he had taken my advice and gone for an exam, they might have been able to catch it. He had a brain aneurysm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, and, and I realized it was really, I probably would have been in big trouble with the Bar Association um, if he had not passed away. Because, you know, telling a sitting judge that they have yeah, that's dementia is kind of... Um, not cool. No. Yeah. Well, but I felt, I talked to different people and uh, I was told by a, a professor from the University of Washington Law School, who I respect a great deal, who's a conservative person, that my obligation was to my client first. Okay. And I needed to do whatever I could to stop the trial. But I knew it was going to be controversial. I'm not sure exactly what the precise definition of contempt is, but when you're oh. telling the judge that he <clears throat> you know, has cognitive defects, that, that's showing a little contempt, is it not? Well, if he if he does doesn't have cognitive <laughs> defects, I would say yes, it's contemptuous. Um, I, it's a real interesting issue because I yeah. uh, I've, I've talked to other experts in ethics about the whole thing because it became a big deal, and um, I was held in contempt by this judge, but for other reasons, and uh, which, and I'd never been held in contempt before, although I'd come very close, um, and that those reasons were were not appropriate reasons, and they were part of his cognitive problems. Yeah. Um, so I, I certainly, uh, I don't know, I don't think it's contemptuous, it's just, um, do you let your client, who, who may be innocent in this case for certain, go through a trial with someone who um, is not paying attention to anything? Do you run up against a lot of lousy judges? Yes. And a lot of whiny prosecutors? Yes, and I, actually, <laughs> let me fill that out, because I also, I think the other side of that's really important. I have run into some absolutely fabulous judges, and I would say more judges, uh, and I've tried 350 cases in my career, trials, and I would say by far the majority of the judges are good, uh, and some outstanding. Mm. Um, but then there is a small percentage of ones that um, shouldn't have the job. Yeah. In your and, and the prosecutors also. I mean, I, and that's a change from the, the time, the quote you gave from the Seattle Times. Um, one of the things is I no longer, and I have a new associate I'm dealing with now, I, I no longer assume that a prosecutor is not a good person. I assume they're a good person until they show me otherwise, which unfortunately they do from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I don't start out with thinking they're mean and evil. So this is part of your maturation process. You've uh, yeah, it's just easier. Yeah, you know, it's easier to actually it's easier to treat people nicely than to treat people harshly. In your as yet unpublished memoir, memoir which you were so kind to send me a draft of, yeah. and I understand you just got a publisher for it. Yes, uh, but it's uh, just a wonderful read, I have to say. Thank you. Uh, but in that memoir, uh, you uh, credit your success as a trial lawyer to both your arrogance and your insecurity. How do those two things work together for you? Well, um, I'm not sure that it's credited, but um, I believe 
the best trial lawyers, and I think there's very few good trial lawyers, very few, um, are basically very insecure. And they, uh, because um, we're always afraid that the, the prosecutor's gonna know more than we do, or the policeman's gonna know more than we do. So the best trial lawyers over-prepare. Uh, and I think I'm one of those that over-prepares. Um, but I think often um, that is interpreted as arrogance uh, when you're over-prepared. Um, and I think because, you know, we do have insecurities. I do have, certainly have insecurities about, I never think I did everything right. Uh, uh, I'm always criticizing myself for doing something differently. Um, so I think I compensate for that sometimes by being arrogant. Hmm. So, Not intentionally, but you know, I just. So it's kind of a yin yang thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. it is. Because I do believe the best trial lawyers are insecure. And a lot, most people think it's the opposite. And most people think that the best trial lawyers are, you know, just full of themselves and arrogant and yada, yada, yada. But, you know, so you, you don't win cases unless you know more than everybody else so, and, and can tell the best story. Uh huh. So when you're in trial, do you just move very fluidly from arrogance to insecurity? I mean, can, if I were to watch you in the courtroom, Probably. would I be able to see that? Spectrum. Yeah, I think so. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Not intentionally, but um, uh, and it surprises. Um, one of the articles you probably read was a prosecutor who said some very nice things and said that that he thought sometimes my self assuredness was the word I think he used got in the way of my uh, competency. Um, and and I actually thought that it was an honest comment that I agreed with. Mm -hmm. You uh, grew up in the 60s. I did. So quite naturally, you belonged to a rock band. I was in a uh, very successful You uh, helped organize uh, protests against the Vietnam War. Uh, but it was only after you spent 17 hours in jail for allegedly writing a bad check that you decided to go to law school. Nice. What exactly was it about that experience that made it so pivotal for you? So what happened was I got arrested by the narcotics squad on a Friday night at our house uh, for, a, I don't know if it was 12 or $17, but it was a check for an account that I had closed. And um, they took me to jail on Friday night, which is what they always do. So you stay in jail over the weekend because you can't see a judge. And I was in a holding cell with 50 other people, most of whom were black or Hispanic. and. I stopped feeling sorry for myself and started talking to them and realizing that the system wasn't working for them at all. And it was really angered me. So, because, you know, conceptually, theoretically, I had been on top of this issue because I'd been involved with these civil rights organizations. So I knew intellectually that there was something wrong going on mm -hmm. in our country. But when you're in a jail cell, um, uh, it it, it brings makes things, it real. Makes it much more real, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you entered into the legal profession with, I think, a rather jaundiced view of our criminal justice system. You, you viewed it as being often corrupt. Uh, you viewed it certainly as being often terribly unfair to uh, poor people of color. That's all true. Yeah. Um, and you also strongly opposed the death penalty. I did. But, but there was a point in your life when you had serious second thoughts about that opposition. And that was when uh, your girlfriend, a young woman named Deborah Beeler, Correct. was brutally murdered. Um, you were uh, 23 years old at the time. You were going to law school on the East Coast. She was living in Berkeley, California. What do you know about the circumstances behind her death? Well, it's never been solved. Um, uh, I recently checked on that for my book, uh, and it's still an unsolved case. Um, and Debbie was working in a halfway house um, for people being released from prison, volunteering. She was in graduate school at Berkeley. She was really smart. She went to Smith. She was in graduate school in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And um, and they found her um, dead one morning. It was. Uh, one of the, certainly one of the most traumatic times in my life. Um, my father called me at two o'clock in the morning and told me what was going on. And 
uh, it's never been solved. And then I started believing in the death penalty, of course, because anybody that would harm such a, a beautiful person had to be evil and destroyed. But then I actually had a dream about when I was in Chicago in graduate school after law school, and, and in the dream, Debbie came to me and said, you know, don't honor me by believing things uh, in things that I've never believed in. And it was very powerful, and I decided then I would go back to um, opposing the death penalty. I, I just don't believe in killing unless it's in self-defense, Yeah. period. You, you describe that dream in your memoir, and uh, you know, obviously it's still very vivid for you. Uh, was it just a dream, or do you ascribe supernatural significance to it? I don't know. I, I know it was very powerful. So I don't know really how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not that, I'm pretty woo-woo, you know, uh, as far as spiritual things are concerned, but um, I'm not sure I'd go that far. So I think it was a really powerful dream. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about Ted Bundy. Um, certainly one of the m most notorious serial killers of the uh, 20th century. Uh, I take it you were just, what, three years out of law school when the case was referred to you? Mm -hmm. That's correct. W what do you recall about your first meeting uh, with Mr. Bundy? Um, that it was kind of a media circus. Um, he had been arrested in Utah um, and then released on what I consider to be very low bail, and I think the reason for that is the police in many different states were watching him as the Ted, who was responsible for many murders, and were hoping that he would slip up somehow, so they released him. So he came back to Washington from Utah. He's from Washington. He worked for the committee to elect the governor, uh, who was a great guy, that governor at the time. And we had mutual friends, and so they introduced him to me. It was a Saturday. He came into my office through the front door. The two attorneys who uh, referred him to me came through the alley and the back. One of them is the judge right now, and I, I, you might probably know in my book I did not name that person mm -hmm. because he would rather not be named. Um, but there was a media circus everywhere, and Ted would be like, you know, waving to people and, you know, handing out cookies he's made and a bunch of odd things. Um, it, it, I've now put together, when I wrote that part of the book, it was very difficult. Um, because I had put all those dark memories, and there's some really seriously dark memories, uh, into a little compartment and locked it up. And uh, then I started writing the book and um, for fun, and now it's turned out to be somewhat successful, I guess. Um, but going back to those dark days was really, really, really hard, mm -hmm. um, particularly because of Debbie, I think because um, she kept coming back to my mind. And, of course, De then Ted later admitted that he had killed women in Northern California. He's remembered in history as having murdered 30 women. He told you in private that he killed more than 100. There was a point, wasn't there, when you had to wonder whether this guy you were representing was the guy that killed your girlfriend? I did not even, and that's probably some sort of psychological um, denial. Um, I didn't even think about it until I started writing the book. <laughs> because then really? I started putting it together. Well, because it wasn't until about five or six years ago that they found some DNA. Um, they didn't think they had any DNA on Ted, and then they found some, and then they were going to compare it to unsolved murders in California. And so I got calls from police in California and from uh, newspapers and um, media people. and. And then I started thinking about it. But you know, Ted was up and down the I-5 corridor, and he had a girlfriend at Stanford, or somebody he thought was his girlfriend. So, uh, and I think there's enough dissimilarities with Debbie. Now, it's really... Well, look, she, she fit creepy. the profile. She was young, she mm -hmm. was pretty, and she was killed, like so many of Bundy's victims. She was strangled and hit on the head with a blunt instrument. Um, and, and we know, as you, as you pointed out, that Bundy was, tra was occasionally visiting the San Francisco Bay Area during that time, so. As I said, it never um, occurred to me, because when I was representing Ted actively, the, there was no investigations in California. So when I was representing Ted actively, the investigations were in Colorado, Utah, 
Washington State, and then of course, subsequently, Florida. Mm -hmm. So when I was actively representing Ted, there was no indication that he was involved in things in California. Mm -hmm. In 2012, you told a reporter from a publication called the Seattle Metropolitan that you were sure that Ted Bundy was not involved in your girlfriend's death. But that same year, you were quoted by a Fox News reporter as saying that you couldn't be sure. So which is it? Well, um, I suppose I'd like to be sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, nothing's ever certain. Uh -huh. um, I, I, if, if I thought, if I really do, did think there was any possibility that Ted was involved in <laughs> Debbie's um, death, I would not write my book. I would not publish my book. I would probably not talk about things like this because um, it was it wouldn't seem right. Um, but uh, I, that's the best answer I have. I mean, I mean, nobody knows for certain. The uh, the police in Berkeley do not think it was Ted. Yeah. They think it was somebody from the halfway house, which would make sense because whoever. Debbie let whoever it was in the house. She was in a, a night um, robe, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's pretty. The detectives pretty much believe that it was somebody she knew. Mm -hmm. So that would. But you're that's why you're I'm pretty yeah, certain. Yeah, you're obviously you're just <clears throat> on the basis of those two quotes in the same year. You're obviously conflicted about this, right? Is this still something? Well, yeah, that, well I'm conflicted about the whole thing. I mean, I'm yeah. conflicted about. You know, representing Ted and some of the things that I went through and learned and, and certainly conflicted about losing Debbie, who was my only girlfriend at the time and a wonderful person, and then ending up doing what I'm doing. But I, I do think that that dream I had with she, where she was involved, she was telling me to go back and do what I was doing, mm -hmm. which was, I w at the time, I was working in the prison systems and also getting a graduate degree at Northwestern. Um, and at the time, she was working in the prison systems. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the message I was getting from her. Yeah. Early on in your representation of Ted Bundy, uh, you describe how you were approached by a police detective who asked you to help him with his investigation. Oh, yeah. And he actually said to you that in a case like this, the attorney-client privilege should not apply. Mm -hmm. And you very appropriately told him to get lost. Right. But I'm wondering whether you can imagine yourself in a situation where uh, you would betray your professional obligations to a client to serve a greater good, like you know, preventing an imminent threat to, to the public. Well, I, I actually under the um, ethical constraints that we operate under, if I have a reasonable belief that somebody's going to commit a crime in the future, yeah. uh, you're relieved of the attorney-client privilege. Is that right? Attorneys yeah. are like a lot mental, of people don't know that. Attorneys are like mental health professionals in yes, that sense? Exactly. Okay. But you have to have a pretty reasonable belief. Okay. Because the bar, I mean, the bar gets mad when I do interviews like this um, because there's some conservative members of the bar association that say that you can't even talk to your wife about a client that's on the front page of the newspaper. Seriously, our bar association wrote an article recently saying, and it was a bunch of hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're very conservative. I do have a, Ted did give me a release of the attorney-client privilege in writing. Oh, at what point? Um, when, right, about six months before he was executed. Bundy himself presented you with an ethical dilemma when uh, he escaped oh, from boy. prison the second time, which in of itself is rather mind-boggling, yes. and he called you from Florida. Mm -hmm. You know the call I'm talking Mr. about, Rosebud. right? Mr. Rosebud. Yeah, right. So I was sitting in my office, it was um, February, I believe, and it was kind of 7 o'clock at night, and I, I had a small office, uh, and I got a call from my answering service. I always have an answering service. And they said, Mr. Brown, and yes, he said, uh, there's uh, Mr. Rosebud on the phone, and I went, oh my God. Because you know, he was FBI um, number one wanted person for obvious reasons at that point. So then I knew it was Ted. And so I took, took the call. He was in jail uh, in Lake City, Florida, and they didn't know who he was. Right. And so the dilemma for you is if they didn't discover who, he, who they had, would you have felt obligated to rat him out? That was the big dilemma. And because what's the answer to that dilemma? Because I didn't. Um, well, because they didn't, you didn't have to. Well, they figured it out. 
I came very close to violating the attorney-client privilege that night and calling some people I knew in the police department here or the media here. But, but would it have been a violation? Because, yeah, it would have been. But it would have, it would have been a violation. Did he oppose an imminent, well, I guess that's the, no, the key word, see, imminent. You never know, I mean, yeah. psychologically, whether this is a myth or not, I'm not, but psychologically we operate on the principle that, that because a person's been a bad person in the past doesn't mean there could be a bad person in the future. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of the bases of our society, right? So, uh, but I knew that if Ted Bundy ever got out of custody again, he would kill immediately and many times. Um, so now I know he's in custody, he's in Lake City, they don't know who he is, and very often people get released the next day because um, they, they don't keep people that long. So I was, I didn't sleep that night at all. Yeah. Um, because I actually would have gotten in trouble with the Bar Association if I had called and ratted him out. Right. So there is this tension between, on occasion, between your obligations to your client, your professional obligations, and what, you know, may be your obligations to the society as a whole. Um, yeah. And, 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 and so how do that's you think... That's a perfect example. I mean, yeah. that's probably one of the most extreme examples I've ever heard of a lawyer So let's having. say they didn't figure it out who they had. Would you have made the call to no. betray him? You no. would not have. No. No. Because um, I knew he'd either get released, uh, which it wasn't much... If I didn't call that night and call... Lake City or call the Seattle Police Department or the FBI task force or the media, which is where I was thinking about doing, because I was thinking if I called the media, I could, they would probably, and I had a lot of friends in the media, that they would probably protect my identity. Uh, so I figured, well, maybe one of the ways around this would be I can call somebody who would you know, make me a, a, an anonymous source. And, but then I'd still, Technically, that would be a violation of the attorney-client privilege. Right. But I, you know, I, it was definitely 50-50. And then I was so relieved the next morning when I opened up the paper and they figured out who he was. Well, what about betraying a, a client to save an innocent person from execution or a life in prison? You know about the uh, Alton Logan case, don't you? His was a guy who spent 26 years in prison. There was a lawyer who knew for a fact that he was innocent because it was his client that had done the crime, and that lawyer did not feel that he could divulge that information until that guilty client had died. What do you think? What, 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 what's sure the, what's what the right I, answer? I'm not sure what I'd do in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. If um, the uh, person who had been wrongfully convicted was on death row, I I'm pretty much would probably violate the privilege. Um, but if the person was serving a significant amount of time, I don't know. I mean, you, you could actually get disbarred for yes. doing that. Yes. Do you think that's wrong? Do you, think, do you think the ethical rules should change? I don't know how you're going to change them. But I do know that, you know, uh, for instance, the example that you talked about when I told the judge that I thought he had dementia, um, I'm willing to take the risks. You know, being a lawyer is not the most important thing in my life. Um, so if I had to um, give up being a lawyer um, by violating some rule that I may or, not, may or may not believe in with the Bar Association for, for the right reasons, I, I would do it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I don't have to be a lawyer. For, I mean, you know, I've done it for a long time. Um, so it's changes. I mean, the, the real dilemma is if you're, you know, what, 30 years old and you just started your practice and, and uh, you know something that would, uh, somebody's innocent because your client's guilty, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. I, I've never had that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard for me to answer that question because I've never really had that. Huh? Right. Ted Bundy went through a lot of lawyers, but huh? he kept you for two and a half years, right? More, and, actually. And, and, and he said to you at one point that the reason he kept you on as long as he did was because you and he were so much alike. Yeah. And I know on so many levels that's, that's, not, that's crazy, it's ridiculous, but on the other hand, you know, in your memoir you indicate that that comment really upset you. Oh. And I'm, I'm wondering, with the benefit of hindsight, did it upset you so much, at least in part, because you worried there was at least a grain of truth to it? 
No, what I worried about is he would think that. It was right. just like the same thing that, you know, and I, I wrote about it. It really worried me that Ted Bundy thought I was his friend, which he told people, which there's no way in the world I, I would ever consider myself anything like that. I mean, he was one of the most dangerous and disgusting people I've ever met in my life, obviously. And Why was With me, a that's quite a category. And um, so it bothered me that he would think that. And then, you know, I was so young, he, uh, he and I were only three months apart in age, and I think that was intentional. I think he intentionally chose me for a lot of different reasons. And he started buying, when he was out of custody, uh, he would come visit me on a Saturday, and I'd be wearing, you know, back in those days, what, corduroy bell bottoms and uh, penny loafers uh, with no socks and a turtleneck and a, a corduroy jacket. Yeah. And the next Saturday, he'd come visit me and have the exact same thing on. Yeah, he became uh, your groupie as well yeah, as your yeah. client. It was weird. And he did t explain to me, though, by the way. I asked him, because when I was in the cell with him in Miami, um, uh, which is the last time I saw him, um, face to face, when he was in trial there, uh, they called me as a witness, it's a long story. But anyway, that's when he was crying, that's when he, he told me things like, I want to be a good person, John, I'm mm. just, just not. Which I think, sociopaths rarely say that. Sociopaths rarely say they're evil at all. And he knew that he was, a part of him knew that. Yeah. And then I felt, because he was laying on the floor in this Hannibal Lecter type cell, and I was sitting on the bunk, and I said, Ted, you know, when you, back in Tallahassee, when you told me that you and I were so much alike, it really, really bothered me, and, and what, did, you know, what do you mean by that? And he, he said, if I hadn't gone down, I'll never forget, if I hadn't gone down the dark side, I would have liked to do what you do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was his explanation for it. But it certainly bothered me a why, lot. Why did his opinion? It. Why did why did his opinion bother you as much as it did? Why did you care what he thought? Uh, but well, as I said, I cared that he was so deluded that he would think yeah. that we were alike, uh, and I guess superficially, in some ways, we were. Hmm. Um, and but it was certainly not. You know, Ted Bundy, I, I once said in a show one time, and it was totally spontaneous, and somebody said, what distinguished Ted Bundy from the rest of humanity? And, and without thinking about it, I said, he, he had absolutely no concept that somehow we are all connected. Now, I know that's a weird thing for a lawyer to say, and I say things like that all the time, and then people think I'm really kind of over the edge. But I do believe that there, we are all connected in one way or another. Yeah. But if you even said that to Ted, he wouldn't even understand what you're talking about. So um, for someone like him to say we're alike uh, bothered me, you know. And, you know. and the other thing is, you know, I was doing it for very little money. I took a leave of absence from the public defender's office. His parents were paying. I was in Tallahassee in this $18 a night hotel room and came back there and looked in the window and smoked like five cigarettes at the same time and, uh, and just looked in the mirror and said, what are you doing here? I mean, why, why was I doing this? You know, and so it was, it was bothersome, it was very bothersome. Yeah, you, you are clearly one of the most respected criminal defense lawyers in the country, <clears throat> but there were those forks in the road in your life when things could have worked out quite differently, right? Still are. Yeah, um, yeah um, I think um, just yesterday I got something in the mail saying that they were going to vote, me. somebody voted me one of the top 10 lawyers in the United States. I, first of all, I don't believe that's true. I could name 50 lawyers that I think that are better than I am. But I'm complimented by that, and I think I'm very good at what I do. Um, but um, there are times in my life where I was very self-destructive. Um, that, you know, I've been married many more times than I like to think. Yeah. Um, I, just back in the 80s and 70s, just like everyone else, did a lot of drugs and alcohol. Well, um, let, let me take you back to 1969, uh, when you were going to law school, 
and working part-time as a page for ABC News, <laughs> right. which puts you into contact with a lot of political big shots. Uh, oh, I met everybody in the Nixon administration, except one, Nixon. Okay, but one of whom was Spiro Agnew, right. who was, of course, the Vice President of the United States at right. the time. Right. And uh, uh, as you describe in your book, uh, you plan to slip a tab of LSD into his drink before he was to go on the air to do an interview with Howard K. Smith. That's right. And you came very, very close to, to, to actually doing it, didn't yep, you? Yeah, I had it in my hand. My job was working as a page for, um, it, it was a very interesting job to say the least, uh, for the American Broadcasting Company in Washington, D.C. on a show that was called Issues and Answers, which at the time- I remember it. It was yeah. the number one talk, it was higher rated than Meet the Press. And um, and so my job was to entertain guests, make them drink. These people started drinking at ten and eleven o'clock in the morning, in D.C. and um, and prep them a little bit for the interviews, introduce them to whoever the anchors were, uh, and make them drinks and make them drinks. And um, Agnew was uh, particularly offensive to me for a lot of different reasons. He had just called us a bunch of effete snobs, us those of us that were against the war and a bunch of other things. He liked alliteration a lot. Yeah, I remember. Um, and Nattery, so... Nattery, nabobs. Or, right, yeah, right. Yeah, good and, stuff. Uh, and so I said, because well, it's a live show. And so I said, and they get there an hour ahead of time. So I said, well, if I just put this in his uh, Manhattan, which is what he was drinking, I'll never forget that. Uh, and I said, just put this in, then just about when he's on the air with Howard K. Smith like this, he'd start you know, seeing lizards and, you know, yeah. Howard K. Smith's eyes and things. Uh, and I obviously decided not to do that. Yeah. But let, I, let, I came within really close. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Right. Let, let me read the passage from your memoir that relates to this. You, you write, I imagined Agnew drinking the LSD lace cocktail in the green room, and then around the time I'd be leading him out of the room and to the stage, his world would cave in. Maybe the olive green walls would undulate. Host Howard K. Smith would turn into a large reptile. The national audience would see the man undergo a psychotic breakdown. I didn't care. You know, I have to say, that would have made extraordinary television. Yeah. Uh, but at the same <laughs> time, live, right? you probably would have Cut, meant... Go to a commercial. Yeah, <laughs> but it probably also would have meant that you would have spent perhaps at least a decade in federal prison, oh, which would more. have precluded any possibility of you becoming any kind of lawyer, let alone a nationally... Right, well, I mean, I was obviously... If they figured out what happened, which they would, yes, um, uh, I would be the only suspect. <laughs> right. You know, at the time, I I had hair down the middle of my back. I used to put in a ponytail, and wear. Uh, I had an ABC blazer. Um, that had ABC written on it. Um, the producer of the show was the first woman producer ever in the history of um, TV news at that point, and I adored her. She adored me, and I'd be like, she'd get in big trouble. And I get in trouble, and this, I could see a prosecutor making it an attempted murder charge, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. So then I decided it wasn't really, it really wasn't worth it. But it was I, only I did make a, fun a decision of decision made at the last second, really. Yeah, the it was, last oh, yeah it was in my hand. Yeah. But um, he was, I mean, I had fun on that show because there's so many stupid people on the show. I mean, Spiragno, um, George Wallace, one of the most disgusting people in the whole world, you can imagine. And I would kind of make fun of them in a sophisticated way to their face, and they wouldn't understand that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. the, the, and so I got my jollies out sometimes doing that. So. Doesn't that, though, that episode alone where you came so close to spiking Spiro Agnew's drink, doesn't that suggest that you were something of an anarchist? Oh, yeah, and I probably still am. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm a, a, I, I definitely um, question authority a lot. Uh, that's why this job, in some ways, is a perfect fit for me. Because you can't really have a better job if you're suspicious of authority than being a defense lawyer. Uh, and, I'm, and the sad thing is I'm more and more suspicious of authority now than I ever have been. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe we have a lot less freedoms now than we did when you and I were younger. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think our children are gonna have a lot less freedom in general than we had. So I'm, if anything, more suspicious of uh, government 
than I used to be. Mm -hmm. Throughout your career, you've been incredibly open, not just about your professional life, but also your personal life. Uh, you've acknowledged that in the past you've had problems with alcohol and drugs, particularly cocaine. Uh, you've also acknowledged that you've had a history of dysfunctional relationships with women, even though you have never confirm nor deny published reports that you've been married at least seven times. Uh, but you do say this in your memoir. You say, I chose relationships with crazy women, not all, just some. I pushed all healthy relationships aside. If women were nurturing and nice to me, I wanted nothing to do with them in the long term. So now that you're a little older and no doubt a lot wiser, what was all that about? I, it was really self-destructive, I think. Um, uh, there were times, I remember sitting in my uh, house, a waterfront house, where I had four cars, two motorcycles, a, a girlfriend who was a Ralph Lauren model, uh, and being miserable, and being completely... Sounds and, awful. And I was sitting sounds, there, it sounds absolutely awful. And I was sitting in this, and it was a couch, <laughs> and I was sitting there reading this magazine that had my, front, my picture on the front page of the magazine. And I was completely stoned on cocaine and drunk on alcohol. And, um, and I realized now, um, like the other incident you might, might ask me about later, that I was just, I didn't think I deserved any kind of, I didn't mm. think I deserved that kind of attention. Um, and, uh, and I think I made the mistake of um, trying to fix people. So, you know, the more crazy the woman was, the more I wanted to get involved and fix her. Because, see, if I have to fix somebody else, then I don't have to fix myself, right? So as long as I can f focus on fixing somebody else, then I don't have to deal with my own issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what was going on. Getting back to Ted Bundy, um, obviously, no matter how brilliant your lawyer and you are not going to get this guy out of prison. <clears throat> the only real question was whether or not you were gonna save him from the death penalty. And you worked heroically to save his life. But in the final analysis, didn't Ted Bunny wanna die? Well, I, that's one, one um, explanation. I mean, this is a fascinating whole thing is, you know, you read and it's been um, published elsewhere, but not as much detail as probably in my book. After his first escape from Aspen, and I knew Aspen because my band used to play in Aspen when I was in Colorado, so I knew Aspen really well. So he gets arrested coming back through town at 2 o'clock in the morning in a pink Cadillac through Aspen, which only had five streets and um, dirt roads. And, you know, it's like, you really, all he had to do was drive the other way and he would have gone over another pass and been gone. Mm -hmm. After his execution, you have said that you thought Bundy was a really, really evil person. <clears throat> so does that mean that you reject the proposition that Bundy himself was a victim of violent impulses that he essentially had no control over? Well, um, I, I didn't believe people were born evil until I met Ted, <laughs> okay? Because I believe circumstances and everything make people. Um, you know, Ted was a sociopath, he was evil. Yeah. Just, if I can segue into it, Bobby Bales was never that way. Sergeant Bales was uh, class president, was captain of the football team, volunteered after 9-11. You know, we just we destroyed Sergeant Bales. We turned Sergeant Bales into whatever he ended up being. That's not true with um, mm -hmm. Ted. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think. Um, so I don't know if that answers your so question. So when, when you look at a Ted Bundy, it, does it make sense at all to talk about uh, free will or responsibility? Uh, do those things make sense when you're talking to a guy who's, as you put it, born evil? No, but fortunately, there's very few. I mean, uh -huh. there's very few, you know, and I've had thousands of clients, and I think there's very few uh, who are born evil. And, yeah. I, and, and I, some of my friends take issue with me even saying that because there's a lot of people in the psychological profession and spiritual professions that don't believe people are built born evil. But that's my only explanation for Ted. I mean, I, I don't want to go into the stories that are in my book that you've read about him and the mice mm -hmm. and right. things that he did that were yeah. just disgusting. 
when he, you know, so that was the conclusion. Because his mom and dad were dysfunctional in many ways, uh, but not abusive. Yeah. You, you've studied philosophy, so you know there are those philosophers like Spinoza, for example, who argue that free will is just an elaborate illusion. As a defense attorney, do you hold to that view? Hmm. That's a really good question. That's one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Um, do you want to repeat that for the viewers? That's, like, that's the best <laughs> that question was, you've ever been one asked? one of the best yeah, questions okay. I've ever been All asked. Right. And I've been interviewed by a lot of hot shots. <laughs> um, uh, no, I personally believe that free will exists and is very, very important, yes. Okay. Um, do I think there are people who have no free will because of some evil component of their um, biological or mental makeup? Yes. But implicit in the idea of evil is free will. Can you have evil and, have, and, and, and not have free will at the same time? Can you have evil and, and not, not have free will? I mean, you have the freedom to choose, and if you choose badly, that's no, no. evil. I, I don't think. I don't think Ted Bundy is an example. Keep in mind, yeah. I think there's very few people like him. Very, very, very few. Right. I mean, I, I can imagine maybe two or three in my long career, um, but I don't think Ted had free will. I mean, free will. I don't. I think he was possessed, and. Uh, uh, you know, sure, he chose to go from here to there. I mean, he chose to go from Chicago to Tallahassee, so that's free will. But controlling his behavior beyond that, I, I don't, I think he was obsessed with evil. Now, I also, alcohol played a role in everything he did. Um, but I think that just, just diminished his um, whatever small amount of self-control he had. Mm -hmm. Your, your father once said to you in a phone conversation that somebody has to do your job, but then he added, I'm just sad it has to be you. And I, you know, I'm just wondering, that sadness notwithstanding, do you think he was proud of you for the work that you've done, which has made you both famous, and I guess in some circles, infamous? Well, there's been a lot of issues with my father and I, which, you know, we could spend hours on that probably. He's still alive, you know, mm -hmm. as 95 and very smart still. Uh, and I think that comedy made was very profound. Uh, and actually, I, in finishing my book last year, used it because I think he was right. Um, and in order for us to have a free society, assuming we do and can maintain it, there has to be criminal defense attorneys who don't judge their clients, who realize that innocent people are charged often, a lot more often than people think, and that you have to really, really fight for them. But it's a really, really hard job, a really, really hard job, and I think my dad, I'm beginning to think my dad is right. I mean, I'm sorry many times that I have this job, to be honest with you. So why do you still do it? Well, as I told the New York Times, it's my f path. Uh -huh. We might have <laughs> to bleep, but that's we'll okay. Bleep. You, you don't bleep. <laughs> well, I guess it. not. Yeah, we probably. But anyway, I mean, it's just it's just kind of what I'm supposed to do. When I go talk to law schools and law students, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time telling them not to do this job. Yeah. Uh, you know, and this is job is not as romantic as it's made on television. Yeah. You know, you're not supposed to judge lawyers by the clients they keep, right? Because right. everybody under this system deserves competent representation. But I'm not sure it's always inappropriate. I mean, take a lawyer who spends his life fighting for clean water and take another lawyer who's spending his or her professional life representing tobacco companies. Is it so outrageous to suggest that the lawyer who's fighting for clean water is uh, leading a more virtuous professional life than the tobacco uh, company lawyer? Well, I try not to judge people. I'm really pretty good on that. Um, I personally wouldn't have done that. I, I, I've, I'm not sure I would be a lawyer if I didn't do what I do, mm. um, which is that whole thing. It's my path. It's really kind of what I, I'm supposed to do. But as my dad said, it's really difficult, and, and, and there are times more and more now that I wish it wasn't me. But I don't try to judge those people, but I know I wouldn't make a living um, probably doing either one of those things because they're just not my path. Right. Um, right. So, you know, I'm just a, you can't find a person who 
is more of an advocate uh, for freedom than I am. I, you can't. I mean, and I mean freedom in the uh, Jeffersonian sense. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, Robert Bales. Uh, he's a U.S. Army sergeant uh, who, in a plea deal, admitted that he had murdered 16 civilians in Afghanistan, nine of whom were children. Uh, early on in your representation of Bales, uh, you said that his case was more of a political case than a legal case. What exactly did you mean by that? Well, it was uh, President Karzai had called for him to be tried in Afghanistan and hung by his feet, I believe was the quote. Um, and we were having a lot of, well, we've always had difficulties in Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan, which I mean, that was actually one of the most interesting things I've ever done in my career. Um, being, and I was at the worst part, I was in a forward operating base in full body armor with a bodyguard who was five foot one woman who I ended up adoring and would take her in a minute as a bodyguard. She was like a cat. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was, the whole thing was political. Um, the army didn't want him to have a private lawyer. They did everything they could to try to keep us out of it. They wanted to keep it in house. They didn't, they sent me a security clearance form which I refused to sign, which I find a hard time believing that some lawyers sign these things. They tell you on the front page it's going to take a day and a half or two to fill it out and that they're going to go to all your neighbors you've had your whole life, you know, and everything and do all this. And I said, I'm not going to be vetted by the government to be a defense lawyer, period. I won't do it. And I figured they'd throw me off the case, but they just dropped the issue. Mm -hmm. But um, that was the political part of it. They didn't want private lawyers. They didn't want to tell us dirty secrets about the war, which we know and I know, um, and a lot of these things are not known by the public, um, which is one of the reasons why we got the case um, moved from a death penalty case to a non-death penalty case, which I never thought we could do because there was so much political pressure. You, you think that they took the death penalty off the table because of your not so subtle threats to put the war on Iraq on trial? Exactly. I definitely think that's true. And I think a, as much as I came to respect the JAG lawyers, the, the, the Army lawyers, um, most of them, um, wonderful people. You know, I slept in a bunker with one of them for 14 days in Afghanistan. Um, they can't uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. violate orders. I mean, there, there were things that I did representing Sergeant Bales that if a military lawyer did, they would be held in contempt because they'd be disobeying an order. Um, mm -hmm. And let's see, civilian lawyer doesn't have that obligation. So. Yeah. You know, at the time of his ar arrest, uh, I believe Bale said he couldn't remember what happened on the night all those people got killed. Uh, by the time he pled guilty to those 16 murders, did he recover any memory at all of what occurred? I'm going to have to be coy in my response to okay. that question. Okay. Okay. Um, there are still things that um, I call him Bobby, that Bobby doesn't remember. Um, but in order to accept the resolution without the death penalty, we had to agree to certain facts. So that's all I'd like to say about that. So it is conceivable for someone to plead guilty to a crime he doesn't remember committing? Yes. And that's actually legal under a case. Um, Alfred versus North Carolina. You know, innocent people can actually plead guilty if they say that they don't want to take the risk of going to trial, which I, I do find intellectually troublesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's it's legal okay, for people you... to people who claim they're innocent yeah. to plead guilty. Yeah, but in terms of what the state of his memory is now, you don't you don't feel like you're in a good position or, uh, to uh, shed any light well, on well, that. First of all. Sergeant Bales was diagnosed with PTSD. This was his fourth deployment. Mm -hmm. He should have never, ever gone to, to Afghanistan. He was injured. He had a concussive head injury. Um, he went to a small base in the middle of nowhere, 10 kilometers away from the home of the Taliban, where he was treated like a slave by special forces. The special forces gave him drugs. The special forces gave him alcohol. Um, so uh, we created him. Mm -hmm. Uh, we turned a man, a young man, 
who was student body president and took care of a disabled man, young man, for, for four years out of his uh, young life for no reason other than be a good person. Uh, and, and we look at what happened. Mm -hmm. Robert Bales was sent to prison for life yes. without the possibility of parole, but yeah. you've expressed the hope that in the fullness of time his sentence would be con uh, commuted. Uh, how likely a prospect do you think that is? I think with some time, um, his sentence is going to be computed by the commanding uh, officer of his, wherever he was assigned. In this case, it would be um, uh, JBLM, uh, Fort Lewis. Um, and the commander right there now is the commander who wanted the death penalty. <laughs> so we're not going to go there mm -hmm. um, for commutation. But sometimes there'll be some other commander there. Uh, uh, people who understand the problems with our soldiers and what they go through, um, uh, somebody is going to be in that job someday who will understand that. Mm -hmm. Last question. I, I know that you've expressed the hope that after the Bales case uh, you would slow down a bit, but my understanding is that you're working harder than you've ever worked right now. So. Um, is there a chance that you will be slowing down? What are you, 67 years old now? Eight. 68. Uh, so is there a chance, say, within the next 20 years, you'll slow down? Huh. And if so, uh, what do you imagine you would do with the uh, extra time? Well, um, there's more. My, I mean, I just finished a nine-week trial, as I told you, mm -hmm. which is a nightmare to think about for any trial lawyer. Then the next day started a murder trial, which I'm in now. And then I have three trials backed up behind that as soon as this one is done. So I will be in trial until January nonstop. And that, it's hard to imagine how stressful and difficult that is unless you do that job. Because when you're in the courtroom, you have to be aware of everything. Everything. And you have to pay attention to everything. And you have to know everything. And frankly, I, um, I, if it wasn't for my young associates at this point, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Um, I would like to, um, right now I'm supporting nine people, uh, my staff, and my family, and my father to a certain extent. Um, so I feel a little bit trapped. Um, would I like to slow down? Yes. Do I think I'll ever get there? Probably. Do I ever think I'll stop being a defense lawyer part-time? No. Uh, my dream would be to work um, one week a month, come back, meet clients, and try take cases to trial maybe three times a year rather than 15. Mm. That, I'd like to do that and, and write, a, uh, write another book that's fiction. Well, I'll definitely read it. <laughs> John Henry Brown, thank you so much. Oh, thank really you. It was a pleasure. It.